Thank you, Benji. Thank you, thank you. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, wanted to talk about bead today um, as it has been a hot topic around our industry uh, for a while now. And I think um, it's important that we talk about it and understand what this funding means. Not only what it means to apply for it, but rather what it means um, for you if you're not planning on applying for it. So, and after today, you may be inclined to learn more and actually consider uh, throwing your hat in the ring uh, for this money. Like most government plans, uh, it's not easy, but there are, impl but there are implications that uh, can and may affect your business if you do nothing. So let's get started first. Uh, a disclaimer, with any good government program, there's always disclaimers, right? So uh, here's the biggest thing. There's a lot of changes going on right now in real time. Um, and even as we speak, WISPA is really hard at work uh, lobbying on our behalf um, for the interests of WISPs and making sure that you check the latest information before you uh, make any decisions on your business or make any network changes or anything like that. It's highly, highly recommended uh, to make sure that because, like I said, these things are in flux and, and changing. Um, with that, um, was it March uh, at WISP America? There's a broadband billions of boot camp. I'm going to give you a slide about that later, uh, but I wanted to just put it here. Uh, there's going to be talking a lot of information. It's an all-day class or an all-day seminar on just this topic. So if you have the opportunity to attend, I hope you guys can. All right, so what is BEAD? It's a broadband uh, equity access and deployment program, um, which is, this is the JOBS Act that the Biden administration passed for billions and billions of dollars uh, with just over 42 billion of that money um, for broadband. And the idea is to get those connected that are unconnected and have everyone um, connected with what they call reliable broadband. So what's, what's reliable broadband? So the term reliable broadband, the NTIA means broadband service that the broadband data maps show is accessible to a location via fiber, uh, cable modem, hybrid fiber and coax, digital subscriber line, DSL. Yes, they threw DSL in there, which I'm still scratching my head on that one. Uh, terrestrial fixed wireless technology utilizing entirely licensed spectrum or using a hybrid of licensed and unlicensed spectrum. So utilizing entirely licensed or a hybrid of license and unlicensed. Notice it doesn't say unlicensed only. So for those of you who have only unlicensed networks, please, please pay attention. So WISPA is very instrumental in getting this hybrid definition added here, as well as this license connectivity being still a requirement, but WISPA was able to get CVRS frequencies to be allowed and considered as a licensed frequency. So we have a way out. So where are all these funds going? Well, all this area in red here, this is what the NTIA calls underserved and uh, unserved locations. In other words, where reliable broadband is less than 25 meg down and three megabits up. That's a lot of area across the country to try to cover. And I'll bet that a lot of this area is covered by what we already do today, but because of the definitions, um, of what uh, broadband termed deemed is, um, some of our networks probably aren't being considered as covered. So uh, underserved or unserved rather locations is any area where there is no broadband service at all, or it's 25 meg uh, down, three meg up. And then an underserved location is an any area without service or without offering speeds of 100 down or 20 up. That's a lot of area and up for interpretation and uh, service that we're trying to cover under these narrow, narrow, uh, basically definitions. And we have to try to service that with now licensed technology. So what? Well, why does this matter? Okay, these funds can now be applied for and potentially granted to a competitor to compete directly against you for a coverage area where you already have service. This means government money can be used to install fiber, wireless, whatever, 
under the definition of providing reliable broadband, even though you have ample coverage in that area, even though you are already offering reliable service, in other words, more than 25 meg down and, and three meg up, and you have happy customers. So your service must meet that definition, otherwise you're uh, subject to possibly being uh, in that market of unserved or underserved. So are you covered? Well, it's important to know that your area may not be considered as having reliable broadband service with just unlicensed fixed wireless. Um, unlicensed does play a role, but only as in the hybrid model when it accompanies a licensed service, specifically to high cost areas. A high cost area is an area where the deployment of a network is cost prohibitive due to a terrain or sparse population. So what does that mean? So if, if you're trying to service uh, a desert area, well, there may only be a home every 20 miles or uh, perhaps in the Ozark Mountains or in the Smoky Mountains. It just, the terrain, it doesn't make sense to put fiber. It doesn't make sense. You have to use something else. Wireless is perfect for that, but they're allowing uh, unlicensed broadband to come in and play into that world, but only in that world right now. So how do you protect yourself? How do you protect your network? Network. Well, to stay in the game, you got to deploy a CBRS solution. Overlay a CBRS network uh, of your existing area or do your expansion with CBRS. Um, get your network up and running and be able to install a client within 10 days of your request as part of the requirement. So you don't have to install 100,000 customers on this one network. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about setting up the coverage area to show that you have this area covered and you can serve it. So you don't have to have you know, a lot of customers on it or any really, but you have to have the ability to do it. Do your reporting. So the form what was it 477 was required. Now it's, now it's this broadband data map uh, or broadband BDC, broadband data collection, I think it is, um, that's required every two years now. So make sure you have this network up and that you're reporting your information so that your area is getting reported. Um, and there you go. So show that it's been covered and avoid essentially being overtaken by a competitor. So um, I wanted to also point out to you guys, I told you I would on um, the Broadband Billions Bootcamp, which is happening and look at what they're doing on the first day of the first part. Learn how you can apply for funding or prevent companies from using funding to unfairly compete with you. So this is a hot, hot topic. Wisp was talking about it. They're out there doing it. Um, so the, the question is, or not the question, the answer is deploy a CBRS network and, and get yourself in this, in this protected area and enter buy cells. Uh, that's what these guys do. And I bet, Eric, I bet you guys have a solution for us. Do you not? Yes. Yes, we do. So I'm going to go ahead and start my, my slideshow. Um, yep. I can end. All right, uh, screen. All right. All right. You see my screen, Matt? Yep, we're good. All right, perfect. So I'll hop around a little bit here. Uh, the main goal here isn't to, you know, push buy cells to, to, to sell a full buy cells deployment. You know, we're a private LTE uh, manufacturer. We do make equipment. The main goal here is for you guys to understand, you know, that hybrid model is what we're trying to preach right now. It's, it's trying to get you to understand that, hey, if you don't have a, a network deployed where you can have someone up and running in 10 days, then someone can come in, get funding to go over top of your network. So the goal here is to, to introduce you to, you know, a buy sells LTE network to show you how quick and easy it is to put something like this up and just to have that entire coverage that you're looking for. So on your screen now, what you see is a typical buy sells network on, on what it means to do. So at the tower, you're going to put up your enode Bs and those enode Bs will be covering, you know, all areas. You know, three, four 65 degree antennas on these enode Bs, and you're getting anywhere from three to 10 miles based upon your terrain. That's coverage. That's what BEAT is looking for. They're looking for that coverage. 
you know, you take that coverage and it says 10 days to install. All you have to do is go out there with a CPE, hang it on the customer's house, and you have their network up and running in under 10 days. I mean, that's all it is to, to make sure that you are actually covered there with the bead funding. So to take it a step farther, Matt mentioned a couple of numbers, 25 by three and also 100 by 20. 25 by three is fairly simple. Uh, in CBRS, unlicensed, it's fairly simple. So it's that 100 by 20 that makes it a little bit more complicated to have that full coverage. Uh, and to get that 100 by 20, you just need equipment that will do carrier aggregation. So an example of that would be the Nova 436Q by BuyCells. Uh, it provides 290 down and 35 megs up for the sector. So the coverage on this, one to three miles with terrain issues, you know, clutter, uh, and then clear line of sight, you, you can reach seven to 10 miles pretty easily. Max users, about 192. So this has your external antenna where you can decide, hey, do I want to go 65, 120? I mean, I could even do a 360 just to show coverage for a specific area. I wouldn't recommend doing an Omni, but that option is there. Um, something like this is a quick, easy option. And if you want something easier, we have base stations with integrated antennas. With clear line of sight, you're looking at three to five miles on this. This has a 65 degree antenna. And again, carrier aggregation on the up, so you can get 35 megabits per second on the uplink. This is, these are the numbers that they're looking for, and this is the coverage that you're going after. Just that important factor is getting coverage. So now knowing what it looks like, some of the equipment, what does it look like? You know, who has done this kind of thing before? So let's start with the city of Las Vegas. You know, they came to us right when the pandemic hit and said, hey, we need to get our students online quickly. What can we do? This is before the beads funding, but this is directly related to why the beads is out there now is because of all the underserved areas like right here in Vegas, believe it or not. So what you're seeing on your screen is two blocks away from the stratosphere and there's a whole lot of kids. I mean, hundreds of thousands of kids right in that area that they don't have internet because they can't afford it. So the city of Vegas came to us and said, what can we do to make this better? Um, Quick, easy deployment, they hung up four 436 queues facing northeast, south, and west, and then they sent the students home with just a simple indoor device. They have the coverage for three to five miles, but they were using indoor devices to easily connect students. You know, this is a simple, easy deployment for the students themselves, for them to walk home with just a regular little CPE, put it inside and get it going, that's a lot less than 10 days. So. That is one way that you can look at deploying. How did it look from a standpoint? There's your deployment on the rooftop. Uh, you had your SIM cards, and then you had your actual CPEs. That's all it was for this network. And what does something like this run? All right, so the basic bill of materials for the buy sells portion, you had those four 436 queues, some carrier aggregation license, SIM cards, and uh, some integrated CPEs. So total came to about $32,000 for just the buy sales portion. And with 100 customers, that's right around $330 each to get this network deployed. Um, they could have hung this up, got it up and running probably in five to 10 days and had this going all out to their students using our cloud core. So with LTE, you do have that complication of the evolved packet core where your SIMs are being provisioned. Normally it's done on a server, but with buy sales, we put it in the cloud for quick and easy deployments. So that's one thing to look at with your, your base stations. You have a quick, easy way to deploy an eNode B on the tower to get the LTE coverage to cover yourself from beads very, very quick and easy. And then you're up and running using our cloud core. You don't have the extra complications of deploying a local network manager or a, a local evolved packet core. All of it's done for you within the cloud. So even taking it one step farther on ease of use is what we include in the box. So in the box of just a 436Q, you get your power supply, 
you get some cold shrink. You get the GPS um, assembly, DC connectors, and also the SFPs. All of this is included. We want this to be quick and easy for you guys when you get out there. So we set everything up to be that quick and easy deployment. So with all that being said, with understanding the coverage, all of that, what is private LTE and why does it matter? So private LTE is a standard space technology where you could utilize, say, our base stations to get the coverage you need, but then you could turn around and utilize a different company for their, their CPEs. An example of that is you could use our base station by cells with, say, a Google Pixel phone. You have coverage, easy installation, uh, everything's there for you. So because it's standard space, you have different devices to choose from, different options to choose from, and that could actually help lower the cost of deployment. So all different factors here are pointing toward a standard space technology that gets you the need coverage that you need, but then you're able to shop around for everything that you want. You're not stuck with one technology, uh, one vendor. You could actually look at doing buy sells with Ericsson or buy sells with Nokia. It's just you have many different options with going with private LTE and the coverage of deeds. That's basically it for me, Matt. Uh, I, I hope I went into the coverage good enough for everybody. And I hope that you know I, I gave a basic understanding of LTE and how it can help. Do we have any questions? Questions, questions? Yeah, so while, while Benji's looking that up, I, I hope that people are understanding where, where I'm coming from. In, and hopefully you weren't coming to say, hey, how do, how do we get, uh, how do we apply for this bead money? Um, th th that's a whole animal in itself. But I'm hoping that you guys understand whether you do something or do nothing, this is coming. And there's a lot of money behind it. And the only way you're going to be able to do it is if you protect yourself in some form or fashion. Um, yes. Yeah, so the key of what Matt's saying there is you're protecting yourself. You're not deploying this to, to get customers up and running. You're deploying this to protect yourself. This is a low cost way of actually protecting your network from someone getting lots of money to deploy over top of you. And then conversely, if you're thinking of expanding in any new area, you might want to consider starting with LTE or uh, starting with CBRS because um, you have you want to protect yourself moving forward, right? So uh, it would be probably unwise to go with just another unlicensed broadband in an area. You will likely get beat out. Matt and uh, Eric, I'm going to cut in here. We do have a question from Manuel. He says, "How he asks, how much?" does a typical CPE cost? So a typical CPE cost, there's many different CPEs to look at and choose from. So I'll show you a couple of different on my screen, just because. So this is an, indo uh, an outdoor that hangs on a house. This ranges anywhere from $99 all the way up to about 180, depending on the options you want with it. 11 DVI gain here. Um, you go a little bit higher into the gain. This is a 14 dBi gain here. Same options, uh, and that starts at about $150. Then you have indoor devices. So uh, let me grab another indoor. This, this is like watching QVC. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, so you have different options. So this is an indoor. This one will run you about 120 to 180-ish, depending on the options. And then you have a, a better indoor one that's going to start right around, I think, 280-ish. So with LTE, I, I just showed you four options. Uh, we're not the only company that makes them, so you can continue to shop around to look for the options you need. Like, why is this one more expensive? This would do more throughput. This also has Wi-Fi 6E embedded in it, so that way you could actually you know, have your network set up. This it doesn't do as much throughput, and it only has the old Wi-Fi 4 on here for you know your BGN connectivity. And those are available at Streetwave, right, Matt? They are on the show. All four of them. Yep. yep. All four of them. Okay. I hope that answered your question, Manuel. Um, we have another question from Sean. P L T E, what spectrum is it? And what is the cost to buy or lease the spectrum? All right. So private LTE. Uh, it can range any frequency at all. So, for example, of that, uh, T-Mobile has private LTE spectrum. 
Uh, we deploy on CBRS, which is band 48. It's 3550 mm -hmm. to 3700. That's the spectrum, band 48 for CBRS. And what's there is how much is it to lease? It's actually $2 per device when it goes above 23 dB EIRP. So there is, with CBRS, uh, it is a lightly licensed spectrum to where all the information is kept in a database in the cloud called a SAS, Spectrum Access uh, System. Mm -hmm. And all of that information sits there. So that $2 a month is to sit there and monitor where all these devices are and trying to keep all the devices from interfering with each other. And this is how WISPA ended up getting it to where it could actually be part of the BEADS funds is because it's trying not to interfere with itself. So with paying that money, you're paying for that less interference than what you would get with your univans. And just to be clear, Eric, that uh, no matter the buy sell, that that's just inherent with with the way that CBRS works. This correct. This, this isn't a buy sell fee or anything that is being added on. Th is, that is absolutely correct. Yep, this is part of the way that CBRS works for the reporting to make sure that the network and that you know you're getting what you're getting. You're supposed to be getting. Sean, I hope that answered your question. If you have a follow up, uh, go ahead and type it in. We'll we'll ask them. Um, and I don't see anything else here coming in. Uh, Eric and, and Matt, do you guys, Matt? I'm sure you have questions for Eric, or Eric, you might have questions for Matt. Yeah, Eric. So I, I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, what if? What do you guys have as far as if someone just wants to test or just to try LT? They've never done it before. They want to get their teeth wet or their mouth wet with that, what do they do? So my biggest recommendation is actually to get a hold of StreakWave. But if you're just getting into private LTE, um, what you have is going to be, we have a starter test lab kit where it's basically an indoor uh, LTE access point. Uh, one of the indoor CPEs that I showed you a minute ago, a pocket router, and you can get into LTE, learning LTE for right around, I think it's $1,700, you get all of those devices. So you get to learn it there. Now, if you're looking for an outdoor deployment, we do have a bundle as well with one eNode B, five CPEs and five Wi-Fi routers to get you going with, um, with LTE and a complete tower deployment. And I believe that bundle starts at right around 8,500. Right. All right. And we just saw two questions come in. You want to read the yeah. first one? Sean, Sean uh, replied here, no, no fee if the radio is under 23 EIRP. So how that works, Sean, is there's devices called CVSD, sort of uh, CBRS devices, uh, and they're higher powered than the ones that are 23 dB or below. So the 23 dB or below are considered end user devices something like you know a cell phone, uh, an iPad with LTE on it. So those devices, they don't have any power associated with it. They're not gonna interfere with anything. So they're actually free uh, on the SAS. But when you're communicating back to one of the enodes, getting out an enode B here. So this device is what will actually cost you the money then. So you'll have to pay for this uh, device and then the other ones will be free when you actually add them onto the SAS and the CBRS um, system. All right. I'm gonna follow up, Sean. You keep asking questions, so that's good. Who do we pay those C those sub feasts? So right now there are five SAS vendors. It's Google, well, four: Google, Amdocs, Federated, and Sony. Uh, Comscope fell off the bridge. Uh, so they're the five different SaaS vendors. You would go in, you would register an account with them. Then you would become certified to be able to deploy CBRS. And from that point on, you'll be able to actually add devices onto the CBRS network, but you would be paying uh, those fees to that CBRS SaaS vendor. All right. So Scott has a question. What DC surge product do you need? Matt, you got that or am I answering that? Uh, I prefer if you took that. 
Yeah, not a problem. So with the DC search, you could choose anything you want. I mean, your basic DC search is what you're after. Uh, I, I think for the most part, uh, we see transector being used everywhere. That's what I was going to uh, say. That, that's what we recommend is the transector poly. Yeah, I mean, I can pull up part numbers for you, Scott. We can send that to you later as well. But it's just basically your DC. When you're dealing with something like this, uh, 430 here, this is PUEN. So of course you're gonna be protecting that ethernet instead of the DC. I hope that uh, answered your question, Scott. If you have a follow-up, go ahead and type it in. We'll, we'll get to it. Uh, Joel, Joe, sorry, Joe is, is the bead fund also for US territories or is it just continental US only? It is for U.S. territories. It's for uh, the entire, all the states, the U.S. territories, and tribal nations as well. So uh, there's a lot of money out there, and to my knowledge, everyone, all the territories eligible, and I think most of all the tribal uh, territories that have been eligible, and certainly all the states, have applied for the money. They said, yes, we want it. There was an application process the states had to go through to get this money. That has been completed. Um, so yes, the short answer is yes, it's include all the territories are. Cool. Uh, Brendan asks, is it common to have outages with a SAS? Seems like a reason to not use SAS after a recent federated outage. So yeah, I'll take that one. This is a fun <laughs> one. Uh, you know, there's only so much we can do as, you know, Streakway being a distributor or ourselves being a manufacturer. Uh, the federated outages, it was, what, three in a month? That, that's horrible, hideous, without a doubt. Uh, but there's nothing we could do about that. We could continue to, again, protect the coverage of your devices. Uh, but when it comes to having a higher entity cause a power, uh, an outage, we can't stop that. It's like your DYA also getting a an outage you know that that's something beyond your power uh as far as is it a reason to to be afraid of sas 100 it is it's, it's another point of failure uh but it's also something else to consider something to look at a again it's part of that license spectrum federated had the issue google did not uh they're the two primary uh providers out there for sas you can look at the other two as well and check their record with amdocs and sony uh, they're not as known. So from what I heard, again, hearsay, I don't know 100% what happened. With Federated, they had a customer with somewhere between 18,000 and 180,000 devices. You know, that, that zero, uh, I'm not sure about. Uh, and they all went offline and came back online at the same time. So when the online came back in, all those devices requested a, a, a registered SAS. Uh, and because of that, it shut down all of Federated. So again, it is something a, something you're you can be concerned about with Federated. But then, if you just try and figure out why it's happening, uh, hopefully, it is being fixed for the future. Cool. Well, we got another question, Scott. Uh, this one's for you, Eric. I'm sure. Any news <laughs> about creating or increasing the wattage for CBRS? So there hasn't been any news. There's been speculation that companies like AT&T and Two Mobile are pushing for a new CBSD category. Uh, and that's to bring up your EIRP currently from 47 dB per 10 watts up to somewhere around 60. So it would be pretty hefty, don't get me wrong, completely hefty uh, to do something like that. You know, And what I mean by hefty is we're sitting here looking at my device here. This is about 40, 344 dB EIRP. Uh, this is 20 watts as power consumption. But uh, as you're getting into those four by 60 watt devices, you're talking about 600 watts of power consumption. And that does make a difference. But as of now, there it's still just speculation about, you know, AT&T and these larger companies pushing for a newer device. Uh, that's so Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so the next question, can you therefore host your own local server from the SaaS vendor? So unfortunately, no. Uh, 
you can host your own server. So for example, I have a buy sales network manager sitting on this mini forum right here. Uh, this will act as a domain proxy, you know, communicating to the SaaS, but because I still have to communicate with the SaaS, whether it's local or actually uh, in the cloud core, you still have to go through that SaaS vendor. So at the end of the day, even if you had everything local, you still needed to go through that SaaS vendor uh, to, to make your network up and running. So how it works is that your ENOB sends a heartbeat. Just, you know, pink, pink, saying, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. And this, it keeps the SaaS vendor happy. So it retains its entire license from the SaaS. When the SaaS drops, it takes away all the licenses and then it asks for a new heartbeat, a new registration. And that's why it goes through that entire registration process. So with a local network manager, it just hits that local server, that local network manager, and then goes to the SaaS. Whereas with the cloud core, it goes straight to the internet, then to the SaaS. So with the local server, it just changes the direction of the actual, how it's getting to the SaaS, but it still gets to the SaaS vendor. Well, I think that's all the questions. Uh, well, let's, let's give them a, a minute or two or a few seconds to see if there are any other questions, but do you guys have any questions for each other? I, I like your haircut, Matt. Uh, same. <laughs> <laughs> I thought uh, you were going to do a, a Bee Gees rendition of Staying Alive there. Oh, no, I don't do that. <laughs> Dancing, singing, that's not my thing. <laughs> well, I don't see any other questions coming in. I appreciate everybody who oh, did join. Oh, we, we got two oh, more. Two more. All right. They don't want us to leave. They don't want us to leave. <laughs> I like is that. I like that. Is there a contact for your Las Vegas deployment? So you can reach out to Streakwave, uh, your Streakwave rep, and then from there, they can get you in contact with Buy Sales, and then we can do that. So if you go to Buy Sales YouTube page, we do have, I, I think, seven to 10 case studies. Yeah. You'll actually see uh, the, the city of Las Vegas on there as a case study. And these are production works. They're like a small little infomercial that's actually fun to watch. Uh, our guys go out there with drones. They fly them around. They do a good job with the interview process. They're really, really good to watch. So I'd recommend going to YouTube and checking out the buy sales case studies. There's that second question from Brendan. Is CBRS useful for PTP or just PTMP? I don't People do use it. PTP, right? Can you? You can. Uh, there are a couple of devices out there that can do it. Uh, it's it's not as useful. So in, in most situations, most CBRS vendors, your base station has the higher power and then your CP has the lower power. So that's why it always ends up being more of a uh, point to multi point play than a point to point play itself. It can be useful in either direction. So if you use a, a lower power device, let's take um, this is going to be an example outside of CBRS, but it's the only example I could think of on why you would want to do a point to point. Uh, some colleges had band 41, and for them to retain that band 41, they had to use the service. Uh, band 41 is 2,500 to 2,700 uh, uh, gigahertz, 2.5 to 2.7, sorry, gigahertz. And they had to use part of that spectrum to show that they're keeping it. And so what they were doing is they were actually buying uh, less expensive buy sales ENODBs, hanging them up with a less expensive CPE just to make sure that they were showing that they were using that device. And then they would put a camera at the end of it to where it was always uh, sending and receiving data. <laughs> 